I tell you what, as we we kick off this series, right, this is love. The truth is, now this may seem a little strange in our current particular political climate, but I believe that love is everywhere. I believe love is everywhere. My, My wife, a couple months ago, Julie, she had her car stolen in the church parking lot. I mean, come on. Right, we called the insurance gal and you could tell she was a scout from the South and we're like, yeah, and she's the pastor's wife. She is not. <laughs> and we're like, it was doing church. Lord help us. <laughs> right, she was, right, do criminals have no shame? And so we recently, we got a new two Julie car, right? That new one. Um, and she, right, she loves it, right? Love is everywhere. She loves her new car. We love food. Oh my word, I love food. I tell people the reason I run and I work out, it's not to be in shape, it's so I can eat. It's a simple equation, right? I love food. We love our pets. In our house, we have a litter of five mini golden doodles. We have a lot of love in our house right now. And praise God, they're going home in a week because we also have a lot of something else, Um, right? We love our pets. We love the seasons, right? All of a sudden, fall hit one day, and then it goes back to summer. Uh, but, But we love our seasons, right? We love cities. They're different cities that all of us, we love, we enjoy. We love songs. We love our hobbies and our activities. We love books. Oh my word, I love books. My favorite is true stories of survival. Anything where somebody almost died, send it to me. Right, I love it. I eat that up. True stories of survival. We love books. We love sleeping in. Amen? Probably not this crowd as much. We love sleeping in. We love getting up early. How about, how about the getting up early folks? Yes, we love getting up early, right? We love this movie. We love a show. We love this post on Instagram. Julie, my wife shared a couple, couple weeks ago, months ago, I think now she's like, right, Instagram faith. You're scrolling. You're like, oh, that's so good. Others need to see it. Right, you share it. We love an Instagram post. Maybe we love our schools. On Wednesday night, I stood in the back and there were people dropping on their knees in praise and in worship. There was spontaneous prayer that was breaking out. The room was full. And I stood back and six years into this ridiculous, silly journey of planting and launching a church, I stood in the back and I went, I love this church. Love this church. My wife, she loves Dr. Pepper. Amen. Glorious. Thank you. I love coffee. I love everything about coffee, right? I love the brewing of it. I love the grinding. I love the smell. The I love, I have really low blood pressure. I inherited that from my mom. So my hands are always cold. Literally right now they're cold. And I love holding that warm cup, right? It's like, ah, oh, I love, I love coffee. We love, we love so many things, vacations, days off. There's certain clothes that you love. I got to wear a hoodie yesterday. I was very excited. Right, it was chilly. I love that. Right, we love sports. Amen. Julie's like planning the menu for this afternoon and for tomorrow evening. You got You don't have a place to go. Talk to us. Come and watch football at our house. It's a. It's a tradition. So we love that. We love sunsets and sunrises. Some days it seems like we love just about anything and everything. And yet, in loving much, I think we have lost sight of loving most. In loving much, I think we have lost sight of loving most, right? It's that age old cliche, if everything is important, nothing is. And the more, right, we're so quick to say we love something and so it begins to diminish the meaning and the impact of any one of those loves. See, loving all the stuff results in loving others little. Right, loving all the stuff results in loving others little, right? What happens, you get an epidemic. You get an epidemic of loneliness because people aren't being seen. Loving others little results in hurt. Why? Because unloved people act unloving to others. Can I get an amen on that? When you begin to love others little, right, you get an epidemic of division because less love results in more and more walls between us and that intangible them and they, the evil they and them, right? Because we're not loving others and loving others little eventually ends up in hatred because a lack of love lets slights fester and grow. You see, scripture says that love covers a multitude of sins, but when we love others little, right, there's less love to give to that slight, to cover over of that offense. And so instead it begins to fester, it begins to grow, and it 
gets to full-blown hatred. And so because of that, I think we need a refresh on the meaning and the purpose of love. We need a refresh on the meaning and the purpose of love, right? The apostle says the greatest of these is love. That's what matters most. And so we need to go back to it. We need to kind of reclaim it, right? That's the point of this whole series. As we're going to look, right, this is love. Well, what does that mean? Because I use the word a lot. We got to reclaim it. So I want you to go with me. This is in John chapter 15, verse 12. Jesus is going to, he's going to give us really two verses that, that just I, I blow my mind and blew the minds of all those listening at the time. And he says this in the context, hello, need more love. More love. There you go. Kayla's like, yep. Um, right? We need, we need more love. And so he says, he, he gives this, we're, we're going to get into it. John chapter 15, he's telling this incredible metaphor of how he is the vine and all of us, we are branches that have been grafted in and that we need to stay. We need to use this word abide. We need to soak into the vine and that actually apart from the vine, apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Incredible, right? And, and all that is rolling over and washing over the disciples as they're listening to this. And then he goes further. John 15, 12, he says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. This is my commandment. Now that word in the Greek, it's literally a military instruction. These are the orders of a military commander. Now this should make us perk up and listen because Jesus rarely uses words like this. Jesus is a servant, right? He wants to lead from the ground up. So rarely does he take kind of these authority, kind of I'm, I'm at the top and, and I'm issuing a command. And so when he says, this is my command, we should lean in. We should listen closer because he doesn't do it that often. He invokes his role as commander of heaven's armies. And our commander has given us a clear and specific Direct order and orders are to be followed. Orders are to be followed. It reminds me of one of my favorite movies, right? A Few Good Men, Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson. It's a great movie, great scene, right? Iconic scene. They're in the courtroom. Tom Cruise's character, Kathy, interviewing, right? Nick, uh, Jack Nicholson's character, Commander Jessup, right? About the, the importance of orders, and Commander Jessup, right, is going back and forth. No, no man would question an order. No, we, we follow orders. And, and, and Tom Cruise is right, are you sure? Right, are you sure? And they go back and forth. And finally, Commander Jessup, right, Jack Nicholson says, we follow orders, son. We follow orders or people die. It's that simple. Truth can be said in our current world. Truth can be said in our current world. People are dying and our commander has given an order that we love one another as he has loved us. We follow orders or people die. It's that simple and people are dying without the love found only in Jesus Christ. Right, when you look at it, he says, love others as I have loved you. Again, there's four words he could have used for love in the Greek language. He could have used storge, he could have used eros, he could have used phileo. No, he chose agape. It's this togetherness love. It's the love of, the, of God the Father to God the Son. It's the love of the Son to the bride of Christ, the church. And it's the love of those who are in Christ to a hurting world around us. That's the kind of love. But here's the deal. If we are to follow through on this order, Order, then we must understand how then does he love us? If I'm to follow this command, then I got to understand, right? How did he love us? I'm going to offer you five things this morning. There's so many more, but five that leapt out at me. First, how does he love us? He seeks us out. He seeks you out. He seeks me out, right? This began in the, in the garden of Eden. Right, Adam and Eve, they, they had gone opposite of God's intention. They ate the fruit, right? They committed sin. It entered the world for the first time, meaning they went their own way rather than God's way. And immediately they knew it was wrong. And what did they do? They went and hid because of their shame and their hurt. So they hid. What does God do? 
He seeks them out. He's looking for you. He says, Adam, where are you? He pursues him, right? God seeks you out. This happened over and over again throughout the Old Testament. God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, right, would go walk opposite of God's direction. They would turn their backs. They would sin. And God kept seeking them out, kept pursuing them, culminating in God sending his son. Literally taking on human flesh on our behalf that he might seek us out. Jesus, his most famous parables, right? The lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son. The hero of the story is the one who has sought after, seeks out and finds that which was lost. Luke 19, 10 says, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. How does he love us? He seeks us out. Next, he calls us by name. He seeks us out. He calls us by name. Naming is a deeply important, deep theological and profound thing. In the garden, right, uh, God creates Adam. Then he, he walks all the animals by him. And what does Adam do? He names them, declaring his authority, his dominion over them. He essentially says, I will now care for them. They are mine. Why? Because he has named them. Jesus names you. He calls us by name. Isaiah 43 verse 1, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have purchased you. I have summoned you what? By name. You are mine. You are his. He has authority and dominion over you, right? So he seeks you out. He calls you by name and he exchanged his position for you, for me. I mean, picture this, Jesus, right? uh, God incarnate, he's on his throne, all is right in the cosmos. Angels are spinning around the the seraphim, the cherubim. They're just proclaiming God's goodness. All of that is happening. And he says, no, wait, everything is not good. I'm separated from those I love most, my sons, my daughters. Therefore, I will exchange my position. I will willingly relinquish my seat on the throne of heaven and go to them. He exchanges that. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. John tells us he made his dwelling among us. He exchanged that position. Philippians 2, 6 and 7, Paul writes, though he was God, Jesus, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Why? Because he loves you. He seeks us out. He calls us by name. He exchanges his position. He walks beside us. He walks beside us. He says, I'm not just going to come there. I'm not just going to now, I'm not just going to come to the earth. I'm not going to just go sit on a different throne on the earth and rule from some distance. No, I'm going to draw close. I'm going to walk beside them. One of my favorite books on discipleship is called The Way of the Alongsider. That's what Jesus has done. He walks beside us. Psalm 23, 4. You've heard it before, I'm certain. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. Why? For you are close Beside me, your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. How does he love us? He walks beside us. And lastly, he points us then to an everlasting kingdom. Right? He doesn't seek us out, call us by name, exchange his position, walk beside us, and then just assume through osmosis we're going to figure out who he is and what life is intended for. No, he gets specific about it, right? He points us to the everlasting kingdom. He does this over and over and over again everywhere he went. This idea that God pursues you, he cancels your debt, and he covers and heals your sin sickness and welcomes you into an eternal kingdom that will never be shaken. This is his job. This is his passion. Luke 8, 1, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Love others as I have loved you. This is his command. How? He's going to, he seeks us out, calls us by name, exchanges his position, walks beside us and points us to the kingdom. This then becomes the model for how we are what? We are to do what? Love others as he did. Right? Let's simplify this. We must seek them out. Or we're going we're to go to others, find them where they are, meet them in the midst of their hurting. We're going to do this. Why? Because this is love. 
We're going to call them by name, right? The indication that I'm going to get to know you. Right? I'm going to know your name. I've heard this. It's such a simple but powerful thing. I've heard it repeated over and over again. People, folks here at Harbor, they come back. Why? Because somebody took the time just to know their name, remember it, and greet them by name the next time. How simple and honoring that is to seek someone out, to call them by name, to relinquish our perceived position, right? This idea that I'm somehow better than somebody else. I was meeting with a gentleman this week. Oh my word, this just happens to be my calling. This just happens to be what God has asked me to do. I am no better than anyone else. We have no position over anyone else. No, I'm gonna exchange that just as Christ did. I'm gonna treat others the way I need to be treated. And I'm gonna point people to the kingdom of heaven. I'm gonna speak boldly and profoundly of the truth of Jesus's love, again, that cancels debt and heals our sin sickness. And all of that, right, Jesus says that. And if you're in the room, if you're there and you're listening that love others as I have loved you, right, they're beginning to process the whole, I am the vine, abide in me, all of that. Okay, that's, that's heavy, Jesus, I'm, I'm trying to balance that. And then you're like, oh, love others as I have loved you. Whoa. Right, they're kind of processing that. That's washing over them. Everybody's just kind of right, mouths open, trying to figure that out. And then Jesus doubles down in the next verse. He both simplifies the command and yet overwhelms everyone in, their, in, in attendance and all of us by its application. Simplifies it, but then overwhelms the application because it goes further. John 15, 13, he says, greater love has no one than this that someone lay down his life for his friends. Wow. Greater love. That word greater there in the Greek is megas. Means abundant love, strong love, large love, intense love, fierce love, mighty love has nothing than this, than someone to lay down his life for his friends. This is love summed up in the willful laying down of one life for another. Again, this is the point of the entire series. It is the foundation of our faith. This idea of love, of willingly laying down our lives for others because Christ willingly laid down his life for every one of ours. And so we're gonna, we're gonna unpack this, particularly in a couple areas next week. We're gonna look at what does it mean to lay down my life? Not just generally, but specifically laying down our ideology. Too much. We let our ideology inform our theology. We let our politics determine our beliefs. No. We're going to lay that down. We're going to lay that ideology down. We're going to lay down our comfort and maybe even our safety on behalf of others. We're going to lay down our advantages, right? Any advantage that you've been given. Maybe it's where you were born, who you were born to, what you were born with, the color of your skin, the not color of your skin, whatever, the color of your hair, right? Your gender, whatever. All of those, whatever that advantage is, and all of us have some level of advantage. No, to lay down your life is to also lay down that on behalf of others. We're going to look at that. Why? All for the sake of another, that they might experience and receive Jesus is love. You see, then Jesus does what great commanders always do. He doesn't just issue a command. He doesn't just issue it. No, he follows through and models its faithful application. He doesn't just talk the talk. No, he walks the walk. They don't even know this, right? They don't know this is going to happen. This is John chapter 15. He hasn't gone to the cross yet. He hasn't given his life for the sin, for the hurts, for the debts of all humanity. And yet he knows he will. He models this for every single one of us. Recently, my middle son, Zion, and I, we finished reading a book together. It's called Kingdom Man by Dr. Tony Evans. Incredible. I love, I love Tony Evans. He's a pastor down in Dallas. And it's just a great book on manhood. My, my middle son, he's 18. It's like, all right, we want to, this, we have a kind of a whole process in our home, right? Of moving young men and bringing them into manhood. And so we completed this book and there's a great line in there. Tony Evans says this, he says, a kingdom man knows the way, shows the way and goes the way. I love that. 
Why? Because that's exactly what Jesus did, right? He knew the way, he showed the way, and then he went the way to the cross, giving his very life, laying it down, demonstrating all the love that we just saw in every specific way. He lays down his life for you and for me. And even that phrase, laying it down, right? It means literally that we would lay uh, prostrate on the ground, right? Our faces on the ground in in a posture of complete defensivelessness. I can't defend myself. I can't protect myself. I can't do any of that. No, I'm gonna lay down. Why? All that someone else might receive and believe in the love of God. Therefore, I'm gonna will, I'm a willfully lay my life down for the two-pronged gospel to cancel the debt that none of us can pay and to heal the sin sickness none of us can heal. Jesus did that for us, that we might lay down our lives for others. Prophet Isaiah, looking ahead to Jesus, says this. He sums up this kind of love so powerfully in Isaiah 53, 5. He said, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds, we are healed. Friends, church, This is love. Jesus laid down his life for us that we would lay down our lives for others. I'm gonna invite the band to come back up and and we are, we're gonna move into that time. We're we're gonna have, we got again, two baptisms. Paula and Ryan are gonna share a little bit, right? This is love. This is what it looks like. This is what it means. And the world is desperately hungry for more of it, for any of this kind of love. And we have been charged to pass it on. Our commander in chief has issued an order that is to be followed. Again, we follow orders or people die, son. It's just that simple. This is the command from the leader of heaven's armies. And so I have two questions for you today. First of all, have you received this love, right? We're gonna hear from Paula. We're gonna hear from Ryan just a little bit, right? Them describe, men. they have received this love. They've accepted it, put their faith in it. My question for you and for those watching online, have you received this love, this always pursuing, right? Let's keep that in mind. You have not figured out the one area that God goes, you know, I went to the cross and all, but I didn't cover that. That is just a hot mess and I just, it's it's too much. You have not figured out the one way that is too much for God. Jesus paid it all. Have you received that? Have you received that sitting at home or in your car, wherever you're listening to this to? Have you received it? If you haven't, man, would you do that today? Again, it's that private decision, you and Jesus in your own mind, in your own heart. I believe, Jesus, that you went to the cross on my behalf to cancel a debt I could never pay and to heal me of my sin sickness that I might be welcomed into an eternal life that begins today. Have you received that? You have to make that decision in your heart and in your mind. If you've done that, man, online, please let us know. Comment in the section. We want to follow up with you. If you've done it here, man, let somebody know here in the room. Share that. This is about community. And then if you have received that love, the next question is this. Would you choose a posture of humility in loving others? Would you show others the love that Christ has shown to you? Would you seek them out? Would you call them by name? Would you give up your position and convenience? Would you walk alongside others? And would you point them to the gospel, to the kingdom of heaven? Would you let people know specifically, not thinking, well, it's just osmotically. They're going to get it. I'm a nice person. I, I hang out with them. They'll figure it out. No, to be specific, Jesus loves you. He gave his life for you. He forgives you. If you would just receive it, would you do that? Again, John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. This is 
love. I'm going to pray for us. And then Miss Paul is going to kick our baptism off. And then after that, Jordan and the band are going to lead us in a song. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you for Miss Paula. I thank you for Ryan. I thank you for the story you've been writing in each of their lives. I thank you for their public declaration of faith that we get to celebrate today. I thank you, Jesus, for your incredible love. It is overwhelming. And like the disciples that were there that day, the first time you said it, I I stand amazed. I'm overwhelmed by it. Oh my goodness, Lord, I, it's too much. Jesus, would you, would you give me, would you give all of us, those watching online here in the room, <sighs> Father, if we have not received it, will we choose right now? Jesus, I receive your love. If it's you in the room, if it's watching online, pray with me. Jesus, I receive that. I believe that you are the Son of God, God incarnate, God in the flesh. I believe that you came to pursue me, to love me, that you went to the cross to cancel the debt that I could never pay, and that you have raised me to a new life. You have washed away my sin, and you welcome me into an eternal life that begins today. I receive that and believe that in Jesus' name today. And the Father, if we have, would you remind us a new to love others as you have loved us in all the ways that you have loved us, that they might experience and receive your love. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.